Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. This is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. I am Hamza. And I am David. And today we are joined by Dr. John McGrail. He is not your mother's hypnotherapist. He is not only a clinical hypnotherapist, but he also works with self-improvement. And he is a sought-after spiritual teacher throughout the country, especially with his company, A Better You Incorporated. And he's going to talk about A Better You and the synthesis effect, among other things that we can get out of him with his expertise. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. McGrail to the podcast. Welcome. Hi. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be with you. Now, yeah, thank, thanks for making the call today. And when I said your mother's hip- hypnotherapist, we, we speak with hypnotherapists from time to time, and the field of hypnotherapy has gone, I mean, it's gone, grown leaps and bounds as far as awareness and not so much seen as a stage trick that you would see on uh, stage hypnosis and so on and so forth. So I, I did want to kind of go over your background. Initially, we can get into all the services you provide but I wanted you to give a quick snapshot, especially in it's January 2018. There are a lot of people that are doing New Year's resolutions, uh, and some of those would incorporate using a hypnotherapist so they don't repeat patterns. So I'd love to get your take on the, the state of hypnotherapy. Well, I think hypnotherapy, first of all, it, it's, it's interesting because you differentiated between stage shows and, and, and hypnotherapy, and there's a huge difference. Hypnosis in and of itself is simply a state of consciousness, and it's a state of consciousness that we all experience every day at some level or another, and we can talk about that if it's interesting to you. But because it's a state of consciousness, when you induce that state of consciousness, you can use it for a variety of things. You can use it to entertain people by having people who want to be on stage act goofy because they want to act goofy, or you can use it in what we call a clinical setting to help people create changes in their lives, like New Year's resolutions, but it doesn't have to be January, it can be any time, create change, growth, and transformation in their lives. And it's been in use for over 7,000 years, and it comes and goes in popularity, but it's as old as humanity because it is a natural state of consciousness. And yes, today in 2018, uh, the profession is gaining more recognition, it's gaining more credence. Um, as as a a, a powerful, valuable therapeutic tool to create physical, emotional, and or spiritual change. Usually it's a combination of all those. And it can be used for so many things because it it affects or it it addresses the very uh, entity that controls our behavior, our attitudes, our beliefs, which is our mind. Now, when... You said 7,000 years. Was was it always known under the umbrella of hypnosis, or did it go under a different model? Oh, no, no. Uh, okay. the, the term hypnosis was coined in the, in the 1800s, I believe, by a man, a doctor, a Scottish physician named James Braid. Before that, it was known as um, mesmerism in the 1700s. Uh, Anton uh, Mesmer was the guy that sort of made it popular in the European cultures in France. And so it was called mesmerism. In ancient times, the ancient Egyptians and Hindus and uh, those cultures just called it sleep. And they had sleep temples where people would go to enter trance at, or hypnosis, one and the same actually, uh, for, for healing. So it's been called many things. But the, the term hypnosis in and of itself, which is the Greek, uh, from the Greek for the word sleep, was coined by the Scotsman James Braden, and it's been in use pretty much ever since. Interesting. So you said a sleep temple. We we had a a a guest on a couple of podcasts back where they were doing what is known as hypersleep, where 
they would break a traditional pattern of six to eight hours of sleep per night and go to sleep for 24 to 48 hours. Um, and the, the premise behind it was to access the subconscious. And when you do it after the, the regular six to eight hours, you have this, this great uh, breakthrough, so to speak. Uh, when you talk about these sleep temples, I'm wondering that may have been the origin of it. Um, and there, I guess what I'm looking for is there are some people that say, well, I want to be able to bring what I learned during my sleep into real life, and I have a hard time making that happen. Well, there may be a little confusion. Remember, the term sleep temples was just a term that the ancient Egyptians used for places where they would use the, the, the hypnosis. Hypnosis is not sleep. It is a state of consciousness. When you're in hypnosis, you're awake, you are aware, and um, you may or may not remember everything you've heard at a conscious level, but it deals directly with the subconscious mind. Actual sleep is a state below what we would call hypnosis. Uh, deep hypnosis would, would be a state of consciousness right before actual sleep. And when you are actually asleep, you are, of course, unconscious. Um, the easiest way for most people to, to access or get, get information from the subconscious mind after sleep is to look at their dreams because dreams are generated subconsciously and they are very powerful tools uh, to help us understand what's going on to and we use it a, a, a technique called dream therapy all the time to help us uh, not only understand what's going on with the client that's in the middle of making a change but to guide them to making that change more quickly but hypnosis and sleep are different things they're just the the term hypnotic sleep is often misconstrued you're always awake you're always aware you're always in control of yourself no one can make you do things or, or anything and you know the concept of hypersleep quite frankly is, is much different than hypnosis and hypnotherapy so we shouldn't confuse the two oh absolutely it's interesting with, with the people in their in their you know respective lanes where uh, I, I guess we're more so I'm more so holistic where I'm like, well, how do you incorporate, I mean, I'm trying to imagine what a weekend would be like. I took a day of hypersleep and then a day of intense hypnosis. I mean, could that even happen or your body would shut down? Well, I don't think your body would shut down. I think you'd be a very, very tired puppy. I don't know anybody <laughs> that could do 24 hours of hypnosis. First of all, um, <clears throat> if you do it yourself, eventually you would probably either fall asleep or wake up. And if someone was, was um, acting as what we call the operator, like a hypnotherapist or a hypnotist, I don't think they could do it for 24 hours. You know, they would fall asleep. So I, I don't, I'm not really familiar with that technique. I've quite frankly never heard of it. But um, to, to do a full day of sleep and then a full day of hypnosis would be exhausting at the very least, yeah. I don't think. Yeah. Hmm. So I'll just ask. I always wanted to know this question. Can can it, does everyone can everyone be hypnotized, or are there are some people that, for whatever the reason, that they can't be? There is a very small percentage of the population that is unable, for whatever reason, to experience what we would call hypnosis. And that, the, the reason for that, it could be varied. It could be because they're afraid of losing control, so they won't allow themselves to enter that state of consciousness. And there are some people that just aren't really wired in their brains for that kind of abstract thinking. But when I say it's a natural state of consciousness, I really mean it. And I'll give you some examples. Anytime you watch a movie or even a good TV show and, and you're feeling emotions, you're hooked in the movie, everything else disappears and you're having this experience for those two hours, you're actually in a state of hypnosis. Your subconscious mind takes over. It can't tell the difference between reality and illusion. And so the movie in that state of consciousness called hypnosis feels real for those two hours. Even though you're conscious, you're awake, you're aware, you lose track of everything until the movie ends. A good TV show can, can create that state of consciousness. Reading a good book, you know, it's 1 o'clock in the morning and you can't put it down. What's going to happen to Harry Potter? And you're feeling all these feelings. The feelings are very real. You're just reading words on a page. And that's because when you get into that state of consciousness, once again, your subconscious mind takes over and creates these feelings. 
Um, daydreaming is a form of hypnosis. So we all do it, every, or most of us do it every day. And there are very few people who either don't have those experiences, they don't get um, captured by a movie, they don't really daydream, they don't, they don't have those experiences, or, or they do, but when it comes time to enter hypnosis on purpose, for whatever reason, they will not allow themselves to go there. It's all about allowance. No one can make it happen. We, uh, as a hypnotherapist, when I do hypnosis, and I do many more things than that, I guide my clients into that state of consciousness, but I can't make it happen. They have to allow it to happen. There's a big, big misunderstanding there, and I'm glad we, we brought that out. No, I, actually, that, that's why I wanted to stay for a second, because you were saying if, if we daydream, then we're also in a state of hypnosis. And yeah. I, I know that Facebook recently had mentioned that people should potentially get off of Facebook from time to time, just because the over-reliance to being on social media and being on your phones, so much so that there is a school of thought that children aren't daydreaming anymore. They're just so focused on the technology. And you're saying that we have to potentially daydream because it takes us out of our current state where we can actually access greater information. Well, daydreaming can be a very, very healthy activity. It can, like anything, um, if it's done to an extreme, and there are some people that actually suffer from um, what what is called a disorder, they daydream so much that they, it affects their you know their performance in everyday life. But yes, um, social media, our phones, video games are all very hypnotic, and they they can become addictive. And anything that is done. Um, in an imbalanced way can be harmful. Anything that, that impedes your ability to live your life uh, productively and, and powerfully and happily is probably not good. So it, in, in, in everything, it's about balance. And, and most of the clients I work with at some level or another have an energetic imbalance to begin with, which is why they come to see me. And again, hypnosis is just one of many tools that we use to help them recreate the balance in their lives that they want. And once that happens with a little daily maintenance, it, it becomes as automatic as the imbalance was, and then they're, they're very happy campers. Mm. Um, I want to stay here with the entertainment again. Sure. I was just thinking about the, the 1950s, 1960s. You know, the advertising companies were said to use some form of hypnosis while you're waiting for the movie to start, and now all of a sudden my... I'm salivating and I really want popcorn or I want to drink uh, soda. Um, so I guess there, David kind of asked, you know, is everyone open to being hypnotized, but is there some level where you can manipulate people to kind of <laughs> do your bidding, if you will, do good and bad in hypnosis? Well, I wish that was true. If I could make people do what I want them to do, then I would I would create a minion of, of an army of people, and we'd solve all the world's problems in a few days. It just, just doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And what you're talking about is called subliminal suggestion, and they did do a lot of experimentation with it, where they would flash words on the screen faster than the eye, uh, than the brain could recognize, the conscious mind could recognize it, un under the theory that the subconscious mind was taking that information in, buy popcorn, get a soda. And I don't think, uh, after many, many studies, that they ever uh, really proved that it was uh, effective. And, and again, it's important to remember that you can't make somebody do something they wouldn't normally do. So if you're not going to eat popcorn, you don't like popcorn, you can't be hypnotized to, to eat it. Um, you know, you, you, you can't be forced or manipulated. Now, when I say manipulated, there are certain techniques like neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, and certain language patterns that when mastered will help a person become more suggestible, and it's a very powerful uh, tool to have for, say, salespeople or customer service representatives to be able to communicate with their clients and prospects at a, at a, at a level that reaches the subconscious mind and makes them more liable to want to do whatever it is. But again, you can never manipulate someone into doing something like that. It's just a fallacy. And a lot of people think about, you know, that's one of the fears of, of hypnotherapy is that they're going to be programmed. They're going to be taken over and nothing could be further from the truth. We can only help people create the changes in their lives that they want. And when one of the first questions I ask a per prospective client 
when they call me and say, is this something that you want to do or is it something that someone wants you to do and thinks you'll be better for it? And if I get the second answer, I'd never take the case because it's not going to work and I don't want them to waste their time and, and money. I'm not cheap. So um, it's really important that if you're going to do hypnotherapy or if you're even going to even the people in a hypnosis stage show they're up on the stage because they want to be part of the show that's the first question a hypnotist asks who wants to come up and have some fun the mm. people that don't raise their hands don't get invited up and the people who do raise their hands uh want to be up there and then there's some testing done and some people get sent back to their seats and some people stay and they do that a few times and then after three or four rounds of that The hypnotist has those people that he or she knows have the capability of going into a very deep state of hypnosis very quickly. They want to be in the show, and by the time all that testing is done, they're already in hypnosis, and so then they just act zany. But they do it because they want to be up there. They can't, you know, you you could never make somebody go up there that didn't want to and then actually hypnotize them to do something they don't want to do. It's just impossible. Mm. So I think you kind of answered the question I was going to ask. Oh, good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly about that, you know, because I've seen those videos before, you know, it's entertaining, and at the same time, I'm like, is this really happening? How can you get these people to, to, you know, act like that? So you mentioned, like, certain testing. What kind of testing would would they do in order to see, you know, what, what the people that they would want for, for their, you know, what they're doing? Well, it's called suggestibility testing, and every mind is different, every human being is different, and there's a small percentage of the population that are naturally prone and have the ability to go into a very deep state of hypnotic trance very quickly. And it's very easy to test for that suggestibility, very little subtle exercises they do. And it's just really how powerful is your mind? How, how well can you imagine and how susceptible are you are to going into this lovely state of consciousness, this daydreamy sort of state? And it only takes a few minutes. And, you know, a trained hypnotist knows what to look for. And it's pretty easy to identify those people that have that ability. And I preface all of this, again, by saying they want to be in the show. They're more than happy to be up there. And so when they enter hypnosis, they're more than happy to take the suggestions the hypnotist gives them, which can seem ludicrous. It can seem crazy. Uh, you can forget your name. And, you know, it's all real for those few minutes. Now, you can't make someone forget their name for the rest of their lives, but you can allow them to forget their name for a few minutes so everybody can have a nice laugh at their expense. Um, but it's a very, you know, it's just basic suggestibility testing. Are you suggestible? Are you willing to open your mind and play? And, you know, there, if you were to go to YouTube or any of these places and look at suggestibility tests, you could find videos that would show you how to do it. You know, can you imagine that one hand is heavy and the other hand is light? And if people that with really vivid imaginations, you'll see one hand go down and the other hand go up. Well, they're, they're a good candidate right there. So that's a very basic suggestibility test. And there are many of them that are very easy to do. Um, and... Pretty much anybody, whether they're a stage hypnotist or a clinical hypnotherapist like myself, uses suggestibility testing so we have an idea of how amenable a client is to having the experience of hypnosis, which then allows us to design an induction that will work really well for them. Some people need more than others. Some people need different sort of verbiage. Some people respond more physically. And that's all stuff that you get with training and experience. And, and, you know, that's sort of what differentiates the pros from the amateurs. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of... Go ahead. And you said that... I think you said in the beginning of the podcast that people are aware, but do they do they remember like when they're coming when they, once they come out of it do they remember the experience and the questions you were asking or no? Yes and no. Um, again, it's a matter of a given person's mind, and some people are able to go more deeply into hypnosis than others, and you can establish a a, a state. And I do this often with clients where you ask ask them to purposely forget some of the things you say so that their conscious mind won't interfere, but the subconscious mind hears and records everything. So there are times when I'll say, look, I don't want you to remember another word I say for the next five minutes because I'm going to give that client some very powerful suggestions that are going to help them create the changes they're wanting, and we don't want their conscious mind to 
to interfere with it. And then, sure enough, when, they, when they're done, they say, you know, I don't remember the thing you said. And I say, perfect, that's exactly what I asked you to do. Just forget what I said. But the subconscious mind is working on it. And these, these suggestions are called post-hypnotic suggestions, which is a suggestion that you give after someone's in hypnosis. And, yes, you can ask someone to forget certain things. It doesn't always work. Some people won't do that. So, you know, again, everybody's different. Every mind is different. No one responds exactly the same way to being in that state or going into that state. But for most people, the vast majority of people, it is a very powerful state of consciousness and a very powerful tool for helping create change because it works at the subconscious level. And the subconscious part of the mind is by far the most massive and powerful part of the mind. Your conscious mind, the part of the mind we're used to working with, conscious, logical, reasoning, uh, free will, our communication ability, that's only about 10% of the real estate. 90% of our mind is operating automatically. And that's where most of our behaviors, our attitudes, our values, our beliefs, our behaviors, our habits, our patterns, good and bad, live in the subconscious. So we have to work with that part of the mind in order to make those changes that we want. Mm. Okay, so I have another another quick question. Did you happen to see that movie Get Out? You know, truthfully, I did not, but I can tell you that I, I know enough about what they did to say that it was, like most things, using hypnosis in movies and TVs, it was completely ridiculous. Okay, that's a question, because you've seen that in movies, and I didn't never knew how real that was when, you know, they – you know, they do something where while they're under hypnosis, they'll ring a bell or something. And then later, you know, in the movie, if that person ever rings a bell, then this, the person reacts and does whatever they told them to do while they're under hypnosis. So well, that, 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 that is possible. You can condition someone to respond to a signal or a trigger. But the thing is, you can't condition them to do something they won't do. In other words, I could put you into hypnosis, and I might say, listen, the next time you hear me say the number four, um, you're going to have this wonderful feeling that you want to have. But I couldn't say the next time you hear me say the number four or a bell rings, you're going to go out and kill somebody. It just wouldn't work because that's Mm -hmm. not – unless you're prone to wanting to murder somebody. So that's the thing. They always take it way too far in movies and TV. Mm -hmm. making people jump off bridges. You're not going to jump off a bridge if you're not already suicidal. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Or, yeah, or a sleeper cell or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I just don't know how much it was Hollywooded out, and uh, that kind of answers that for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like most things, uh, these things are really Hollywooded out, and, and, it, and it's a fight that legitimate clinicians like myself have to deal with all the time because people have these ridiculous misconceptions about what the state of consciousness is, what it can actually do, and, yeah. um, and you know, it, it hurts it, but that's just the, that's the nature of the beast. It's been, you know, they've been doing, they've been using hypnosis for entertainment and goofy books and movies for a very, very long time. Yeah. Okay. But along those lines, I, what I found was in my corporate life, it wasn't on the hypnosis stage at all, but we were doing uh, a lot of research labs. So we were design uh, architecture firm, but there were always people protesting about animal research. And so, because all they associated with it was bad news because that was all that was out there. So for the past 10 plus years, there has been a concentrated effort of, of providing a balance so people can make a well-informed decision from seeing both sides. Is there, not a, a, a lobbyist, but is there some type of, of intention from the hypnotherapy community to balance the message that's already out there? Well, I can tell you that there are several uh, large organizations that are like a guild uh, for hypnotherapists, and no, there is no lobby in Washington. Uh, it, it simply hasn't gotten to that point yet uh, to try to educate people. I think we we do it uh, mo- more individually. Uh, hypnotherapy hasn't gotten to that state yet where there's an actual lobby that's, that's out there, you know, producing commercials and, and doing that kind of thing. As a practitioner, it's just part of my job. Um, and so when I do a workshop or a seminar or I do a lot of shows like this one, 
uh, which is going to reach a lot of people, or television shows, that's when I have a chance to, to sort of tell the truth about what hypnosis and hypnotherapy is and how it works and how, what it can and cannot do so people get educated. And I think as it becomes more mainstream, um, that, that probably will occur. And as you said, the trend is that it's becoming more popular. There are many, many more people practicing this than there were when I started 16 years ago. That was my next question because, you know, people traditionally go a more linear or conservative or tried and proven whatever our parents told us that we were going to do and so on and so forth. And right. then they have a lot of breakthrough, like a lot of people on our podcast. And you said 16, so you didn't start out. Obviously, you're older than 16. What's your story to get into the field of hypnosis? hypnosis? Well, it's quite a long one, actually. I've had many uh, enjoyable and successful careers, starting with uh, military and airline aviation. And then I got into film and television, first as a producer, and then later as a talent. I actually made a living as an actor out in L.A. and then got back into producing uh, in the multimedia field and was a senior executive with a company. But through all of those jobs, I was always... Somehow I ended up being an instructor or a teacher or a mentor or a supervisor. And I realized that there, I, you guys probably don't remember this, but back in 2001, there was this thing called the dot-com crash. There was a big dot-com mm-hmm. bubble, kind of like mm-hmm. the Bitcoin bubble today. And millions mm-hmm. and millions and millions of dollars were invested in these dot-coms that didn't do anything. And the company that I worked for, uh, was purchased by one of these dot coms that had a ton of venture capital and no products, and uh, essentially they ran the company into the ground. And I was one of the first senior executives to get laid off, and you know I had to figure out what. Okay, so now I'm out of work. What am I going to do? And and I thought about it, and I realized that all the jobs that I had ever had, the most enjoyable part of them was the teaching and the mentoring and the coaching of my employees, etc. And so I started looking. F- and I kind of realized that this is really what I love to do. And so I started looking around, and I, I looked in, you know, at getting a Ph.D. in psychology and becoming a psychotherapist. I looked at divinity school. I looked at naturopathic medicine. I looked at all these different career paths. And hypnotherapy was one in which I could get certified fairly quickly as, as compared to those other fields. I had used it myself to help me make some major changes in my life, so I knew it worked. And it would allow me to go to school and start working again because I had a mortgage, I had a wife, I had to make a living uh, in the quickest amount of time. And it helps people so powerfully and so quickly that it just seemed natural. And I've always been interested in the mind-body connection. So that's essentially what led me to go to school originally. And then um, after I did my initial training, which was a year, and I got certified and started my practice, I went back and got a Ph.D., um, and, you know, as I said, I've been doing it full-time now for about 16 years. That's incredible. Especially yeah, going after a getting a doctorate after. Years. <laughs> 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 I really love what I do. Well, that's good. You should love what you do. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's one of uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I guess yeah. you get to see the butterflies, right? I mean, you see the caterpillar and butterfly. There you go. That's exactly yeah. what happens. Have you ever used it in with in uh, conjunction with law enforcement? No, I have not. Um, that's called forensic hypnosis. I am. It, it's just an area that I have not gotten into. Not because I don't want to, but there's just never been an opportunity or uh, an entree into that field. Uh, And again, it's used very carefully because usually to help people retrieve memories and the thing that people need to realize is that when you're in hypnosis, you can have extremely vivid memories that may have absolutely no basis in fact. Uh, But no, I've not ever had the opportunity or the entree into forensic hypnosis, although I would if I I got a chance. I think it would be fascinating. What about... um Using hypno, you know, uh, most people have a hard time remembering their dreams. Can, can you use hypnosis to help remember dreams? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a whole process that we call dream therapy, and um, it involves having people, when they wake up from a dream, write down the dream. And we look at the symbols in the dream, we look at the timing of the dream, you know, and, and the type of dream and when it occurred, and there's a lot of different factors. You know, you can buy these books um, 
on dream analysis, and it's really a very slippery slope because they will give you different meanings. If you dream about a snake, it means this, and if you dream about a train, it means this, and the truth of the matter is because everybody's different, your snake and my snake might be two different things, and the context in which we saw the snake in our dream could be very different, and your train right. and my train may be going different places and have different meanings. So those books are really sort of useless. The only uh, universal symbol that everybody pretty much agrees on is that if you dream about your teeth falling out, uh, it indicates that you have a fear or, you, or that you're feeling that you're losing control of some part of your life. But aside mm-hmm. from that one universal symbol there really isn't a set. But yes, it's very powerful for helping us understand what's going on subconsciously, how a person is creating the changes, what they're venting. If they have some negative energies, they need to vent like a bad habit. And we use dream therapy quite a bit to help us guide a client through the process in the most um, efficient and quick way possible. So yes, dreams are very powerful because they come from the subconscious and the subconscious is what generates the behaviors. Yeah. What's your take on the Fitbits, right? There are a lot of people wearing them. I wear it now. And where you're actually measuring your sleep from light sleep, REM, and deep sleep, is there a way that you can look at that data and kind of change the data so you have more access to going through and uh, enhancing your dream therapy? Uh, you know, that's a question I really can't answer. I. I I work with sleep issues all the time, but the issues that I work with are just helping people get what we would call a healthy, restful night's sleep. So when they go to sleep, they stay asleep, or if they wake up, they have to go to the bathroom or something, they can get back to sleep, and they have normal cycles because, as you know, as I'm sure you guys are aware, and I'm sure the audiences or most of the audiences are aware, or many, we sleep in cycles. We go, you know, from a light sleep to a very deep sleep to REM sleep, which is where the dreams occur, and we go through those cycles several times a night. But I, I don't know, uh, and have never dealt with, you know, messing with the sleep cycle with a Fitbit as to whether you can adjust it or not. I'm sure it's possible. You can do very much, pretty much anything. You can create lucid dreams where you're actually dreaming, and you know you're dreaming. And um, everybody has that experience from time to time, but you can really practice at it and get pretty good at doing it when you want to. But as far as using the Fitbit to alter your sleep cycles, I, I really can't comment on that with any any expertise whatsoever. David and I always look at ways, ways of hacking, and, and my personal experience has been to, and I've been doing it for about two months now, where I'll sleep or I'll set the timer for three to four hours after I initially go to sleep. And then I set two timers. One is for the three to four hours. And then the next one is the time I'm scheduled to wake up. And I found that breaking that sleep pattern has enhanced my lucidity. Well, that's really cool. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just really interesting. That, that's why we love having guests like you on here. And, and so you were talking about the dot-coms, and it was I was – just having a conversation the other day about those pink slip parties in the, in the late 90s, which was indicators that the market was going to change. And it's really interesting how much growth we've had in techno- the field of technology from 99. Like, we were trying to do so much during the dot-com era on dial-up, and a lot of companies have grown from the lessons learned from the dot-com era. And I, I bring it up because, like you mentioned, hypnotherapy has been around for thousands of years, but you are also introducing something called the synthesis effect. And I'd like to talk about the synthesis effect, and is that hypnotherapy 2.0, or if you could just let us know a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Synthesis is the term that I've given to my process, which is a process that combines models, techniques, methods, and traditions, um, some as old as humanity and some products of the latest scientific discoveries in, in the field of, of uh, quantum physics, quantum wave theory, epigenetics, and some of these really interesting uh, neurophysiology. And synthesis is about taking these different techniques, some of which work at a conscious, logical, cognitive level, and many of which work at a subconscious level. That's where hypnosis would fit into it meditation and some other tools and techniques and we bring them together to create change and growth and transformation in a person's life very very quickly 
Hypnosis is a big part of the synthesis process, but the synthesis effect, which is the title of my book, is learning to live your life virtually free of suffering. Now, that, that means different things to different people, but that's the effect. You feel really, really good about who you are and how you're living your life, the choices you're making, and the process that we use to get there uh, is basically helping people getting get rid of their blocks, whatever they may be. They may be negative or unwanted or unhealthy habits, limiting beliefs, like I don't deserve, I'm not worthy of making such and such money or having a great relationship or I'm not smart enough or sexy enough or whatever enough. I mean, we have a bazillion things or I'm afraid of this or I have a phobia around that. So the issue can be whatever it is, and many people have many issues. The process is getting rid of those issues as quickly as possible using both parts of the mind and a variety of tools and techniques, some of which I've developed on my own. And the effect is feeling really good about how you're living. So that's what the synthesis effect is all about. And the book essentially teaches people how to use the process uh, on their own. And I, I basically teach them how to make these changes uh, on their own. And some people need a little bit more help but thousands of people who've read the book have been able to change their lives and and uh, you know just through using the tools and techniques that are in there so i'm very proud of it and uh, it works really well it's it's a continually evolving process because i'm continually learning and discovering things and you know combining techniques and come up with a new technique and 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 that sort of thing which again is why this this whole profession is so you know just amazing because it's every day is new and you learn something every day and no person's the same no sessions the same you never get bored uh, but that's what the synthesis effect is all about both the book and the process and I'm glad you asked thank you oh absolutely I mean getting the word out there I, I'd love to have a balance where uh, I don't like anything that's one-sided because right there's always three sides to every story so <laughs> uh, as they say so I wanted to let you know let everyone know about the synthesis effect, of course. And I also wanted to know, because you were making differentiations between like a stage hypnotist and someone such as yourself uh, that's a clinician. And so uh, what type of, I know there's been some research in the field of hypnosis, but is that on, what's the difference between uh, hypnosis and cognitive, what is it, behavioral therapy? Uh, when we were doing, I was doing some research for, speaking with you, if there was, let's say, weight loss or stop smoking, you guys were pretty much neck and neck. Or are they, I'm, I'm assuming they are not interchangeable. They're not interchangeable. Um, when you think of the word cognitive, you think of the conscious, logical, cognitive part of the mind. And cognitive behavioral therapy can be a very powerful uh, tool for for helping people change their behaviors and you know getting over things like phobias and fears but it works at a conscious level uh, if you combine those some of those techniques with hypnosis which works at theoretically a much deeper level uh, you can sometimes accelerate the results so in my synthesis process there are some CBT techniques that I use with my clients because it's a very powerful tool but they're they're not interchangeable they can work well together uh, I think that's probably the best way to answer that question but they are different um, they are you know they are different hypnosis is a state of consciousness CBT is a sort of a process through which you bring a person through but it's all done at a very conscious wake wake awake uh, wakening wake wakeful oh, sorry about that wakeful level Mm. It, it sounds a lot like um, I was I was taught in sales the ABC method. Like if there's if you're the you're the B in the situation, meaning somebody's coming to you because they were referred to you for something, and then after they see your service, then you will refer them to the C in this instance. And it sounds like uh, based off your explanation just now that somebody may come in initially for the CBT because it's logical, people can touch, feel, and I guess measure a result, and then afterwards they would come to you. Is that a natural relationship? It sometimes happens, but most of the people who come to me that have done CBT come to me because they didn't really get the solution they were hoping for, and so they're looking for more. If someone does CBT, for instance, and then it's just one example, there are so many different 
therapeutic modalities out there. But if someone does CBT and they get the results they want, they don't need me because now they've, they've made the change they want. So most of the people that I see that have experienced CBT are coming to me because they didn't get all or sometimes any of the results they hope for. You know, there's no silver bullet. There's no one tool. There's no one technique. There's no one therapeutic modality that is going to work for every single person on the planet. It just doesn't work that way, just like there's, you know, um, no one solution to any problem. And that's another reason why someone who is good at this uh, arms themselves, if you will, with many techniques and modalities because everybody's different. Some people don't respond well to what we would call classical hypnosis. And so, and, and even within the field of hypnotherapy, there are a lot of different ways of inducing hypnosis. And you can, you can do hypnosis just having a conversation with someone and they don't even really know you're doing it. Um, so while, while, again, you can't make them do anything they don't want to do, if they're more resistant or uncomfortable with, you know, releasing themselves into into what we would call a traditional hypnotic state where there's, you know, sort of eyes closed and they lay back in the recliner, if they don't really like that feeling, then we can do hypnosis in a lot of ways. And the really good ones out there, the good people are the people that learn many different techniques so that when someone has a specific need or sensibility you and, and, and a given tool isn't going to work for them, you can come up with a different strategy. And that's one of the reasons I like my synthesis process is because there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Um, and, and it's just because, I, you know, I, like I said, some of it I've developed myself, but a lot of the tools I use are just variations or pieces of things like CBT, neurolinguistic programming, which is another very powerful uh, a uh, set of tools for, for creating therapeutic change. All of these things, you know, you, the more tools you have, the more adept you can be as a mechanic, so to speak. <laughs> you mentioned that you can talk, uh, sometimes you'll have it in a conversation, which makes me think of conversational hypno- hypnosis, which yeah. also makes me think of the PUA community. So is there outreach to speak with you with the pickup artist community at all? You know, that's really interesting. And no, there isn't, uh, <laughs> or there hasn't been. And then the people, people who do that, um, actually, you know, conversational hypnosis is, is, is more related in some ways to um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is just what it sounds like, neuro, the mind, linguistic, the way we communicate, and programming are the programs we use to get what we want. And the PUA community are, are people that are usually trained in NLP, and they, they learn how to develop these language patterns that supposedly um, make people of their desire more prone to want to be with them. Now, to be honest with you, I don't know how much that really works because if you're not already attracted to somebody, I don't know if you can make them attracted to you. I really don't know that much about it because I'm too busy doing what I do, which is therapy. Um, But no, I don't get a great outreach for speaking engagements. I should look into that. (laughs) (laughs) That community is growing. I mean, it's a whole mushroom in itself. So, I think Most it of my initially engagements are to to civic and social groups, professional groups. You know, companies will bring me in to talk about the power of the mind and performance improvement and enhancement and and that sort of thing. And I love to do those, by the way. So if there's anybody out in the audience that wants to bring me in for a speaking engagement, I'm open always, and uh, can help your employees, salespeople, customer service reps, management uh, do better, work work better, be happier. Um, I work with a lot of um, athletes at all levels and sometimes sports teams, but I work with athletes from Olympic figure skaters and gymnasts to professional baseball players, golfers, tennis players, because, you know, all of that is about the mind. Everything that happens in the body, every endeavor we do, all our behavior starts in the mind. It doesn't matter what it is. And once you learn how to get your mind working the way you want it to, you can perform at a higher level, live a happier life, do better in your relationships or your job, or be a better athlete. Doesn't really matter what it is. Actors, writers, dancers, musicians. I work with all those folks too. I don't know if it was you, but I'm sure, or if there is anyone listening, that there has to be a hypnotherapist that's working with the Eagles because their level of confidence is through the roof so much that I've never seen in my, all of my years of watching them. So, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Hypnotherapist, if it isn't you. Well, it's <laughs> not me. I wish it. But there are a lot of teams that hire hypnotherapists. I know the uh, 
the Atlanta Falcons had one on staff for a while. I don't know if the Eagles have one now. The the uh, San Francisco Giants, the baseball team, had one for a few years. And um, I have discussed the possibility with some teams. I'm not working with any particular teams now. But, again, if any teams are out there and you want to get your guys and gals working better, I'm, I'm certainly open to it because I do a lot of group work. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, the Eagles are playing an amazing level of football right now. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Go Eagles. Um, Can you talk, I know you have certifications in other uh, areas. Can you talk a little bit about what timeline therapy is? Sure. Timeline therapy was was adapted or or was sort of the birth child of um, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. As I mentioned before, Neuro Linguistic Programming incorporates uh, techniques from a, a lot of different disciplines, hypnotherapy, psychotherapy, um, gestalt therapy, and timeline therapy was developed by a guy named Tad James uh, many years ago now. And it's, really, it's a really, really powerful therapeutic tool because it uses the power of the mind and it allows us to, to communicate with the subconscious level of the mind in a very safe way. And it allows people to look at their experiences, good, bad, and indifferent, from a, a perspective where they're not invested in it. They don't have to feel the emotions and all the pain and suffering. They can look at these experiences from a different perspective throughout their lives. Timeline is, is essentially... Um, meaning the time you're on the planet. You, you come into the, the planet, you know, you're born on a certain day and you have a line of time. All the moments you live line up one after another and then eventually you leave the planet and your life is a line of time. That's sort of the basis of, of identifying timeline. And, you know, the theory is that you can, you can look at everything that's already happened to you and we can also take someone out into the future and look at what hasn't happened yet. And you do it from a very powerful and safe perspective, and it becomes in the hands of a trained practitioner that knows what they're doing and knows how to use it. It's a very, very powerful tool. I use Timeline a lot in my practice because it works really, really well, and it saves people a lot of the trauma that they might have to undergo if you regress them in hypnosis and they relive an experience, whether it's from this life or what they think is a past life, that can be a very traumatic experience, especially when something bad happened. With timeline, you can do the same thing, but in a much more benign, um, non-invasive way and get equally good results. So it's a, it's a very powerful tool and Mr. James was, was brilliant in inventing it. That was a great explanation. There are people that would sabotage themselves just because they felt um, supposed to because of a past life. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, many people have issues that can't be explained um, in their current lifetime. And, you know, past life regression has been used for a very long period of time. I don't ever use it for entertainment purposes just because someone wants to do it, but it can be a very powerful therapeutic tool. Now, whether or not that life actually happened is irrelevant, but if a person gets the therapeutic effect from doing a past life regression, that's all I really care about. They feel better than when they came in. They get their, their solution, their results, and, and that's all that really matters. It, you know, there's a lot of evidence, strong evidence, that suggests that we do live many lives, and there's a lot of both anecdotal and scientific evidence that seems to suggest that reincarnation, uh, even though some of the, the, the primary religious doctrines of the world don't believe in it, um, up until the year 500, virtually everybody believed in it, and you know they just made some decisions. That that's, you don't know, want to get into that, but there's a lot of evidence that suggests that reincarnation is real, and what I can tell you is that it can be a very powerful tool, regression, when used correctly for the right reasons at the right time. And it can really help people get rid of a lot of stuff that there's just no explanation for. Um, and we don't care whether it actually happened or not. What we care about is what is the result we get, and that's that our clients feel good. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we had seen that with the timeline. Just one last question with that. Sure. If you can do a futuristic timeline, and yes. you're, you just mentioned the past life regression, so mm-hmm. could you? What's your take on simultaneous time? That it's all happening simultaneously. 
Well, now you're getting into a very deep philosophical thing. I think it's definitely a possibility. I mean, now we're getting into quantum physics and quantum wave theory and string theory and, and all of that. And, you know, I am fascinated by it. I study it. I use a lot of the principles uh, associated with it. But whether or not it's all happening at the same time, to me, is really irrelevant um, as far as my day-to-day existence is concerned and as far as treating my clients is concerned. You know, my big hope is that when I leave the earthly plane and transition back to non-physical, that we get the answers. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, you know, and unfortunately, we don't remember them when we come back, but that would be the coolest thing is if you get the answers and you could actually remember them when you come back. You could have a really powerful life. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it sounds like uh, instead of dream therapy, it'll be a, a incarnation therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of what it is. When you do past life, it's it's really kind of what you're doing. You're just having them, having a, a, a client remember and sometimes relive an experience and see it from a different perspective, ultimately. Uh, realizing that their spirit is timeless and that they transcended that life and that pain and that it's over and they don't have to deal with it anymore and that very often allows someone to release something that's really bugging them in this lifetime. It's mm. amazing to watch it sometimes. It really is. It's so cool. Mm. It was totally, I think this whole hour was the whole caterpillar butterfly effect and uh, we, at, we're we at the top of the hour so I really appreciate you taking your time to make our podcast today. Well, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. You guys have asked really good questions. It's been a great conversation. And uh, if you ever want to do it again, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. And shout out to all the people that have reached out to me in the past few weeks. As you can tell, David's back 100%. So the cold has gone. So thanks for everybody checking on his well-being. He is 100%. So thanks for that. And you have been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And again, thanks again for your time. Dr. John McGrail, before you go, if you can let us know where we can get the synthesis effect and how people can get in touch with you so you can do your speaking engagements. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, the book has done its run in stores um, until the second printing comes out, and I don't know when that's going to be, but it's available on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and I think iTunes in both paperback and ebook. So all you have to do is you know, search The Synthesis Effect or search Dr. John McGrail, and the book will pop up. As far as I'm concerned, thank you. Uh, I can be reached easily through my websites. I have two, uh, www.hypnotherapylosangeles.com hypnotherapy, all one word, Los Angeles spelled out, dot com. And that site is, pertains more to my hypno, hypnotherapy practice. And then there's drjohnmcgrail.com, my other site, which is more about the bigger picture, my synthesis process. And, uh, but I'm reachable through either of those sites, either through email, my phone number's all over the place. I, I can be reached uh, via text. Uh, you know, and, and I have a YouTube channel with a lot of video content on it. And just, again, Dr. John McGrail. And if anybody is interested in having me as a speaker, a guest speaker, or doing workshops or seminars, I do all kinds of workshops and seminars for a variety of different groups. Feel free to reach out. We can discuss it because I really enjoy doing that, and I'm, I'm putting my 2018 schedule together right now. So. I know when I'm going to be traveling and when I'm not, um, and uh, I would be delighted. And again, gentlemen, I thank you very much for your invitation. You've been very kind and generous. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. All righty. Okay, bye now. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.